Welcome to RV Talk Radio. Here we talk about RV living, RV lifestyles, and RV travel. We also celebrate the RV lifestyle that gives us the chance to do outdoor activities that we couldn't do in a normal lifestyle. So thanks for joining us. Grab yourself a cup of coffee, a cup of tea, and let's talk about RVs. Before we get started, please take the time to subscribe, then click on the bell icon to get notified of our future videos. This video is made possible by Ranger Rob Poopy Bags, available on Amazon right now. Hello everyone and welcome to RV Talk Radio. This is episode 120. Yep, we're getting up there. And I want to welcome you to the show. We've had uh, great feedback. We really appreciate the comments. Uh, I keep thinking I'm going to get just slammed with nasty comments. And uh, actually they, uh, they come out uh, to be very constructive. And I guess that's because we, uh, we asked you guys, pro or con, uh, we love your comments as long as they're professional and uh, allows us to build on it. So uh, if there's another way of looking at something or um, or approach uh, or you're against what we're saying or something, give us a common sense reaction answers or ideas or things you want us to talk about and we will certainly go that direction. If you're snotty and troll us, we just delete you. <laughs> we don't pay attention. Uh, other than maybe get a good snicker, but yeah. Anyway, today we're going to talk about what you cannot do as an RVer, and and I I say this in a way that um, as I go from my this is my experience and in other people's experience as I go from a house to moving into an RV and then hitting the road, I want to talk about some of the things that were obstacles, things I could not do or consider since I was full-timing, and uh, the drawbacks of what I gave up as a full-time RVer. And, and some of it's okay. I mean, it's okay to give things up. But there's also limitations on my life and Sherry's life Um at the time or every time we've actually done full timing that you just cannot do. And if you do do it, some of these things I'm going to talk about, it turns out to cost you more. So let's get the conversation started. Okay. So what we cannot do as our viewers. And uh, the other thing I want to remind you is towards the end of the show, I'm also going to talk about RV gossip. <laughs> you know, you know, when I go check out some of the other channels and find out what stupid things they're doing. And, and, and I can always guarantee that I can easily find the, the goofiest stories out there. And it's like, you can't make this stuff up. And uh, yes, we will talk about the bluebirds on the... Uh, RV odd couple and how they're milking that to death to get more views. But yeah, moving on. <laughs> Let's get, I'll do gossip later. Not now. Anyway, uh, uh, what we couldn't do. So here, what, you know, Sherry and I are getting closer and closer to when we, she can retire and we'll probably do some traveling stuff like that. But, um, the first thing I started thinking about is Sherry and I uh, started a business, which you've heard is, and this show is the RV, is uh, Ranger Rob Pet Poopy Bags. Okay, so could I have done that when I was a full-time RVer? I uh, probably could, but it would have been a real pain in the butt. Why? Inventory. Um, imagine, this was just our first shipment, when we created the Ranger Rob Poopy Bags, they uh, were in sheets and they come in a box, and so when you order from companies and have these designed and manufactured for you, you have to buy quantity. <laughs> Why? Because it saves you money. So uh, I'm enjoying a cup of coffee as we're doing this. So where would you put 1,500 boxes of inventory in your RV? Uh, well, <laughs> it's not going to happen. 
most likely you'd have to like rent some place or storage to put it in. And uh, yeah, so running a business like that, and especially when you're small, you tend to have more hands on. Of course, the bigger you get, the more you can automate it and maybe hire other people to handle your inventory and stuff. But I can tell you that would have been an impossible feat for us to pull off the Ranger Rob poopy bags if we were still RVing full time. So that was just a business aspect that to this day, I'm not sure, you know, it'd be interesting to see what the, the company looks like in a few years. But uh, one of the main things is, uh, is as soon as I retired from the company I was at up in Washington, we hit the road. And uh, so we're on the road. And the very first week, we went to Ocean Shores and we boondocked. And uh, so uh, here's some of the things that happened during boondocking. One is uh, it was a beautiful place on the beach at um, a casino a uh, place where they have an RV parking area. Very nice. I, I loved it to death. But it, and it, it was free. Um, so that was cool, I guess. But it wasn't. It cost me about $20 a day. A day. <laughs> you go, how so, Rob? <laughs> well, it was during colder weather. So uh, uh, it was kind of chilly. And so... It was propane. Oh my gosh. We went through a bottle of protein, pro, pro, propane a day for a week to stay warm because uh, it was pretty chilly. And, uh, I, you know, there was no electricity, so there was no way to run our electric heat in there. And so, uh, yeah, we were really, and, oh, and propane was ex, very expensive in Osha Shores. So it was killing me. It was like twenty, twenty six to up to twenty six dollars per bottle to fill them up, and uh, yeah, that was a killer. And uh, of course, you know that's also my refrigerator and cooking, and so uh, yeah, that was uh, that was not free. So if people saying you're getting uh, like free boondocking and stuff. Please make sure you keep in mind that uh, if it's cooler weather, if you got to run your propane heater. You're going to be burning five, ten dollars a day in propane on a mild cool weather. Um, but yeah, <laughs> it was, and, and oh, and we have a propane generator. So, uh, of course, I only had one, uh, I still I only have one solar panel. So, uh, every morning I'd have to run my generator for a good half hour to an hour to charge up the batteries again, uh, even though I had a trickle charger during the day. So yeah, that was definitely a shocker, um, and and it was very frustrating. And of course, when we got there, the first thing we noticed is the internet issue. We were in an RV park before we hit the road, and so at least I had halfway decent internet. And uh, but as soon as you boondock, I have Wi-Fi Ranger on our, our our rig, so I should be able to reach long distance internet. But some reason I could not connect into the internet very well at the casino. And it was, uh, it should have been very easy for my Wi Fi Ranger to connect to it. And I could see it, but I could not get a good connection. So I ended up using our air card a lot on our, uh, at the time. And um, that was frustrating. And so, the battle of the internet is going to, of course, it's so much better than it was in 2006 when we full-time then. But uh, if you're trying to do business on the internet, and and not just, I'm not just talking about videos, which we did a lot of those at the time. Um, one is you have to be really patient. Hopefully, most of the stuff you have to do is just email related, and that's pretty easy. But if you have to deal with, uh, Skyping or or um, things like that, where you have to be in connection with your uh, with a company or something like that, you're gonna start limiting yourself to places you go. And a good example is if you ever watch um, uh, the Freedom Theory folks, 
They are the perfect example of places that they wish they could go but can't stay very long. And if they do, they're stressing out because he has a virtual job at a company up in Washington um, that requires him to have fairly good internet connection. And every other video, you'll hear them talking about bad or good internet connection. And so that's in their planning and when they're going places, they're, they're limited right there of places they can go because they depend on the internet. And so uh, you, you just got to keep that in mind. If you're going to be dependent or you're working virtual and you want to travel, the internet is going to be constantly a battle. Now, there's so many different ways to connect to it. And you can get great connection, but it's going to cost you money. Don't think this stuff is free. And it's not cheap. I mean, like our air card we had with only like 30 gigabytes of data cost $110 a month. $110. On top of other things you know you got going on in life, you don't need another $110. And that was probably cheap compared to some of these other people that are really doing more hardcore stuff that they're probably ditching out a lot more than that. So those that's something you just can't do, especially boondocking, um, to keep your costs down or to be stress-free. Because if you have to depend on your income, uh, I, don't, I don't know how many people I've heard who said they've gotten off the road because of the stress of they can't get any work done. And that's not good especially if the company's depending on you. Um, you can't be roaming around. You may as well just stay put somewhere where you got good internet so this, you don't stress out. And nor would your boss stress out if you can't connect and get connect to work. You just cannot depend on the internet as an RVer. You just need to face that. And if you are going to really have different loopholes to stay connected, it's going to cost you. You will have to pay. And it's not cheap. I'm not talking like under a hundred bucks. I'm talking hundreds of dollars to have good internet available to you even in the oddball places that you go. And uh, that's not much fun. It's not fun at all. And it's actually frustrating. Uh, the other thing is really, I notice I'm boondocking is power. Uh, life is all, it's always all about power and recharging things on limited source on whatever your batteries can handle and how much your solar panels can make. And also your generator re recharging your batteries. And so, it's, it sounds easy, but for our first week, it's like I had this like chain of Chris, it looked like Christmas tree lights of all the things I had to charge up after a day or two. Not just cell phones. I had to charge up my air card. I had to charge up my GoPros. I had to charge up my G40 camera. It was like, and I, I didn't have enough plugs at first. I ended up going to store buying all of these little jumpers so I could charge off of my batteries which suck my batteries down fast um yeah it was and of course anything you want to do in boondocking like watch tv things like that if you're using an inverter it kills your batteries um even a little inverter can really put havoc on a battery to suck them down so it's juggling all day long I, and i don't think that's if you're trying to RV and not have stress, uh, first of all, don't depend on doing videos and stuff all the time. Um, the power juggling uh, and charging systems, all that stuff, is not relaxing at all. All day long, you're constantly monitoring batteries. And I, I don't know about you guys, but that's not relaxing. That's not wonderful freedom. That's a pain in the butt. The next thing that's probably was always keeping us on our toes and things I couldn't do, and sometimes I could, 
is I constantly have to worry about our pets. The cat was a piece of cake, really, other than you know, can't leave a door open or a cat gets out, and that would be a pain. Luckily, we have a very timid cat, so she's not a runner. But Cinder is like, depending where we were at, if we were boondocking, it was always keeping an eye on her. Um, if I let her try to run free at all, which at the time, there wasn't very many people boondocking where we were at, so I could literally let Cinder out and run around. What's the first thing Cinder finds? Somebody dumps some old clams in the parking lot after cleaning, um, I think they were razor clams, and Cinder had to roll in it. <laughs> yeah, that was great. And of course, you're boondocking. How much water you got when you're boondocking? Not much to share. So turns out we ended up going to a state park down the road, found a, a faucet, and had to give Cinder a bath. Of course, she had to ride in the truck smelling the way she did until I got her there. But that was, uh, once again, not very fun. You don't know what's in, when you're, especially when you're boondocking, how people have taken care of the places that you're staying at and what kind of uh, dangers could be in the gravel and stuff like that, like broken glass, <laughs> rotten clams. Um, not to mention people let their dogs poop and pee all over the place, which it's going to happen. But they don't pick up, and if you, one of those dogs have any diseases or anything like that, that's not good. It's like, guys, that's why I created the Range of Rob Poopy Bags, is to make picking up dog waste easy and not a pain in the butt. Or the dog's butt. Anybody's butt. But um, <laughs> anyway, um, that was my incentive. Having a pet... Uh, and then these people that go to RV parks and they'll create this little fence barrier around the front of their, and a lot of RV parks do not like that. And so it's like a little zoo in front of their RV or on the side of it and uh, little barking, yapping dogs. But um, in other cases, if you're not boondocking, your dog has no freedom at all. You got to, you know, obviously follow the RV park r rules no running free dogs. And then Lord, you know, you're at the mercy of the RV parks, um, dog areas, rest areas. Uh, some of them are okay. Some of them are dumpy. Some of them are, I'm afraid to even let my dog go in there. Um, some are great and you just never know. And so, uh, if you're taking a pet, and you're going to go full-time RVing, you've got a whole other set of stresses. So are these things that you don't feel are stressful or not? Or you say, well, that's nothing compared to doing a house payment. Well, if your life becomes nothing but RV, and you have these chronic problems always coming up of constant stresses of electricity and your pets and safety, Lord knows what you got to worry about if you have kids with you. Um, that's that's a whole other stress in itself. It's a different level, different thing, but that can get under your skin. So keep in mind, if you have a business that depends on the internet, keep that in mind. If you have pets with you, keep that in mind. Are you willing to give up some of the freedoms you have with those things just to hit the road in an RV? Or try to boondock. I guess one of the other things I was also noticed is the constant worry of whether the RV is going to break. Um, seems like there's always, and I have a new one, um, seems like there's always something that goes amok. And of course you have that in households and stuff like too, but I've noticed, I've tried to compare the two. A lot of times if something breaks in an RV, it's something you got to get fixed fairly soon, depending on what it is. And a house, I've found that some of the things that you can let slide and do it at your convenience or when your funds are in the uh, appropriate <laughs> situation where you could have something fixed. And so uh, that worry, that stress every day of 
Every time you pull or drive your rig to a new location, depending on the hills, the roads, the condition of things, the weather, um, you're, uh, you know you're driving your house around. And if that house breaks or you, uh, you have an accident or something like that, um, yeah, it's, it's stressful. The other thing I think you'll find stressful, and, and even if you've been doing it for a long time, <clears throat> excuse me, is the fact of just driving. Whether you and I've had both fifth wheels and um, forty foot motorhomes, and even as comfortable as you may get pulling a rig or driving a big rig, you're still stressed. It's depending on where you're driving, depending on the weather conditions, things like that. So, uh, um, those things are replacements for stresses you're giving up. You need to know that. So don't think if you're coming out to do this full-time RVing stuff that a whole bunch of your problems will go away. It's not. You're going to get new ones, and you need to know that. Now, I'll give my right here. I love RVing, and I still I would had the chance for another year or two of uh, full-timing or something. I'd probably do it if the conditions are right, but I realize those new stresses will come back. And of course, now that I have a home, I've got these kind of new, I've got the, the, the best internet you can think of. I have my studio, I have my lights. You have no idea that when we we're doing green screen work in the RV, oh my gosh, to try to get the green screen up, and have lights up and a camera on a tripod along with those lights and stuff and all the plugs and all that kind of stuff and microphones all that uh it was very stressful and it was certainly something that you had to do when sherry was at work <laughs> and uh the dog couldn't hardly move in the, or the cat and uh when you're done you had to put everything away Nowadays, I don't have, I got a permanent studio. My microphones are up all the time. My lights are up all the time. My camera mounts are all up. I have tripods wide open. Um, the podcast room is totally equipped with the microphones and, and splitters and mixers and the whole works and, and they're ready to go. I could go into the other room and be up and doing a podcast in 10 minutes. Um, just like at the studio, I'm at I have two studios. Um, this one too, I can pretty much walk up. It's a little more sophisticated, depending on what I want to do, and still be up and running in 10 minutes without having to put things away and putting them back when I'm done, which is a good habit, <laughs> but it gets really old really fast in an RV. Ford's RV Refrigeration Training Center, a licensed school, has many objectives for only one product, the RV refrigerator. We educate others so they can provide a repair service in their area, repair their own refrigerator, or when they hear throw it away, buy a new one, they'll know the right questions to ask in order to know whether or not their technician has been properly educated. Since 1984, we have saved RV owners money, provided them the best warranty, and reduced our carbon footprint. We accomplish these objectives daily through our service and training programs. Military veterans can even use their GI Bill for our training program, which includes our customized tools and manuals. Visit RVRefrigeration.com to find free DIY repair videos and information on our service and training programs. As a thanks to Rob Scribner, we're offering his listeners a free 11-point RV refrigerator inspection and one free night of camping at our location in Benton, Kentucky. Go to RVRefrigeration.com to call and make an appointment. That's RVRefrigeration.com. Thanks for listening. Stay cool and GBYAY. All right, we're back. And uh, hey, by the way, if you get a chance to check out the Ford Re Refrigeration Training Center, check them out. They're, uh, it's a great program if you're interested in learning some new skills. All right, so getting back to what you cannot do as an RVer. One of the other things that drives me crazy it doesn't happen all the time is being limited to one vehicle, which is like most of the time that's, you know, you can get by all right and stuff, but there's times uh, that can really be 
frustrating because everybody needs their space and sometimes there's errands that need to be ran that are better like a Home Depot run I could do instead of dragging Sherry along with me or something like that or um, and you know sometimes when you do one errand you got to do other errands at the same time uh, it's just nice to know you can always have the freedom to come and go as you please and I know it sounds a little selfish but uh, I mean my wife would say easily I don't have to go anywhere I don't have to do anything but it's nice, nice to know I could and that's not necessarily true uh, when you just have one vehicle. The other thing uh, that happens is um, some people, like Sherry, at some certain time have to work or are working from the RV. And if you, you know, uh, what we've had to do in the past, if we've always owned two cars, we left one at a particular region for quite a while when we knew we were settling down and Sherry was going to start a job down here in Arizona. We lived in the RV. We had to drive up to get our second vehicle and bring it down so we'd actually have two cars with our RV uh, for about 18 months before we bought a house. Uh, like I said, everybody's scenario is a little bit different. Not having the transportation or extra transportation is fine and it does keep costs down things like that but um, you will not and cannot have two vehicles unless maybe you put a little moped or something on your rig and of course uh, who wants to be driving those things around uh, it's hard enough to stay alive in a car let alone a moped but this kind of brings me to probably the biggest thing that that gets old really quick is there's nothing better than two things actually taking a shower and not worrying about running out of water or hot water that's one the second is using your bathroom and not worrying about where it's going when you're in a house or you're using a shower rooms and stuff and you flush the toilet it's going into a septic system which traditionally going to go into a water treatment plant and it's all taken care of but no not in an RV. Every time you use that restroom, uh, the other thing is, you know, you can't. You got to be using one ply paper. Paper. It's always you're always thinking about the stupid septic tank, in gray water, black tank, whatever you want to call it. And uh, you know, after a while, like it really gets old, because it can it comes up a lot. <laughs> Uh, even when you're parked in an RV, you're always thinking about your damn tanks. Do I have to empty the tanks now? It's, you know, you don't want to run them dry and let them trickle. They'll dry out. So typically you'll f let your tanks fill and then dump them all at once. And so you always do your black tank first. So then your gray water can kind of flush out the, the pipes a little bit. Anyway, I don't know. Um. What you can't do as an RVer is not worry about <laughs> your water and your poo and where that's all going. And then, of course, there's the problems with black tanks that don't drain right. They harden up. You don't. You have to add chemicals to them. Um, depending on the weather, they could freeze up on you. Uh, and of course, I've had every one of those worries. Um, and then, of course, if you store your RV and stuff like that, then it's all about winterizing. Um, yeah, and it's just, it's stress. It's another form of stress. Now, it's, like I said, some of this stuff is just, everything you do in life has responsibilities. Owning a house, having a job, owning an RV. I just don't want you to go out there thinking if you're giving up one, you're going to give up a whole bunch of stresses you have in life only to find out you're going to gain a whole bunch of new ones and just be realize they're going to happen. Of course, the old saying is like um, some people say, I, I, I'd kill for some of your problems instead of the problems I got. Well, yeah, that could be true, but... um. Uh, I found at first you kind of laugh about them, all that stuff. After a few months of this kind of stuff, you start going, 
I got to I got to do the tanks again or we got to empty the tanks before we go to our next location. We don't know if there's going to be any place to drain our tanks. It's always about the tanks, all about the water. It's always about the propane. Constantly monitoring those three things will drive you nuts. And probably the biggest thing that always bothered me, and it bothers Sherry too, is we love the places we went. We love the beaches, we love the forests, we love the deserts. But the bottom line is, as soon as you open that door and touch that ground, realize that none of it is yours. None of it. Oh, I pay taxes. No, 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 no. It's not yours. It's not your property. You don't own that property. Yes, nobody can do absolutely everything they want. I couldn't drill for oil in my backyard. I'd get in a lot of trouble. I know that. <laughs> you just don't, can't do it. But the bottom line, I can step in my backyard, and my backyard looks the way I want it to look. It has a garden in it, and I wanted to have a garden in it. It has a pool in it, and it's my pool. It has a cabana with a nice little place to sit, a place to listen, you know, to turn on music outside. Uh, it's my backyard. Can I do anything I want to do in my backyard? No. Nobody can. Even if you own a farm, you can't just do anything you damn well please on your property. But when you're RVing, it's not yours at all. And you must abide by other people and other companies' rules or government rules. Not your rules, their rules on their property. It's not yours. You can look at it and touch it and feel it, but it's not yours. Until you get over that, say, oh, I'll go to all these wonderful places and I can move to everywhere I want, all that stuff. Yeah, but nothing is yours except the RV, unless you finance that and it's really the banks. It's half yours, a quarter of yours, until you pay it off. That bothered me. It's like, I want my dog and cat to be able to have a place that they could go that's theirs. Along with me and sure, of course. But I now have a wonderful chocolate lab that has her own backyard. And she's got her little routine and she can play and all that stuff and a place to go potty. And I don't have to worry about diseases from other dogs and things like that. And I have a cat that's pretty secure and safe in her backyard. Um, that's a nice peace of mind. And it's mine, in Sherry's. I don't know if that bothers you at all, but it bothers me that, yes, the lifestyle of my RV was fun, but I cannot say as an RVer, I own anything outside of that RV. Yes, it's nice to look at all of this stuff and other people are maintaining it and stuff, but... There's nothing wrong with the fact that you might want to own something that's yours other than the RV. A lot of you people would like, well, I'd like to get some property I could put my RV on. Well, the problem is, is ordinances won't let us do that. There's some exceptions out there if you want to live out in 120 degree desert out in nowhere in the middle of uh, uh <laughs> southern way southern arizona or something where nobody wants to go they might let you buy property and put an rv on it because they just don't care <laughs> but yeah that that was the one of the things that drove me and sherry back to owning a house again and uh we're not against owning stuff especially when it comes to cooking if i want a fry cooker or deep fryer, I'm going to have one. If I want a bread maker, I'm going to have one. If I want some cool mixer, I'm going to have one. Not to mention, I've got all my podcasts and run and equipment. And oh, you wouldn't believe the equipment we got for this stuff. I want to use it, and I want to. I need a place room to use it. And uh, also, I want to be able to have guests stop by and 
not have to tear up the living room to pull out a bed so our guests can sleep. And then, uh, yeah, it's just, uh, it gets, those things you'll miss. You may not think you'll miss them, but you'll get these circumstances going, you know, if I still had the house, we could have done this. Maybe you like sewing. Maybe you have certain things you like to do that, oh, we just won't do them while we're RVing. Well, you need to think about that. There's a lot of things you cannot do as an RVer, and that's what this show is all about. Heck, even owning a gun. Some of you, a lot of people out there, you guys like to shoot guns um, and like to go target shooting and things like that. Well, you got to you better pay attention to what the different laws are in every state. I mean, what what's good in Arizona is not good in California, I can guarantee you that, which is not typically true in Oregon, which isn't typically true up in Washington or Idaho or Montana or over in the uh, East Coast. <laughs> it's a pain. And it, a lot of people own guns for a hobby. Um, protection is a whole different thing. But even if you have protection, you can't just go anywhere you want, even having an RV with a gun in it. You need to think about this stuff. And, of course, the next subject would be mail. If you're boondocking, then you got a real problem. Some RV parks can be a pain in the butt whether you can have things shipped to them. Um, some are great about it. Some aren't. But realizing that the simple little thing, like Sherry and I would go, we like Japanese mayonnaise. I can only get it on Amazon. And when I run out, you would think I'd buy enough ahead of time. I wouldn't run out, but I run out. And I want to be able to run over to my computer and order it. I don't have to worry about where I'm at. My, my Amazon knows where I'm at. <laughs> anyway... <laughs> And I can have it ordered in five minutes. And that's that. And uh, in some RV parks, they kept changing the rules of what you could have sent to them. Um, and then, of course, you got your date, you know, your regular billings and medical bills and things like that that go to a P.O. box. Typically, you'd set up in a UPS store or something. Um, and then they have your stuff forward, which you end up paying money for that. And uh, that could be $15, $20, $25 dollars each time they, they unload your mailbox, put it in a box, and ship it to you. If you know how much it costs to ship stuff, you can understand why they charge you that much. Um, that get, You can't deal with the mail the same way as an RVer. And it can actually produce a whole nother stress. Um, just little things like, for example... We try to contact, and by the way, if you have a channel and you're listening to this and you're angry at me anyway, but just remember, it's, it's just a show. But uh, we contact different channels to see if they want to review and do a review of our poopy bags. And we may donate to their channel, uh, donate a product to them, and the fact that they can use the affiliate link of Amazon in their description to actually get um, commission for selling our product. So uh, trying to get a box of poopy bags to an RVer that's moving around is a whole nother stress in itself. And then they wonder why they can't cinch down many business opportunities because they won't hold still because they're always chasing that free camping. And, uh, but yet they still want to make some extra income. Um, they just can't get their priorities straight. You either go out and boondock and be peaceful out there, read books and, and twiddle your thumbs, or get out here in the real world and start working and realizing you got to stay connected and you got to hold still and you got to be a little business-like. Remember that? The thing you gave up? Anyway, <laughs> I'm just saying. I've I dealt with a couple of RVs already. It's like, you guys are the most imperfectional unprofessional, think the world's going to work around you, and it does not work around you. 
You may feel like it's out there that, oh, I'm living my freedom, but you need to connect. If you need to make money and you want some opportunities and people are giving them to you, you need to hold still. You need to be businesslike. You need to be reachable and contactable and you need to hold still long enough so we could actually get a product to you. That's not asking too much. That's called reality. Just, just thought I'd mention that. We know most of you are responsible dog owners and want to keep our parks and recreational areas pristine. Most of us have been stuck with cheap dog waste bags that are inconsistent and cumbersome. That's why we created Ranger Rob Poopy Bags. Ranger Rob Poopy Bags are larger, deeper, stronger, and leak-proof. Most of all, they have handles that make the bag easy to turn inside out and to seal with your dog's business. Ranger Rob Poopy Bags are lemon-scented, eco-friendly, and come in sheets and now in rolls. Stop getting stuck with cheap waste bags when you can have a Ranger Rob quality premium dog waste bags. Ranger Rob poopy bags are cost effective. They're in Amazon and you can get free shipping right now. Make picking up dog waste easier and comfortable. Ranger Rob poopy bags making dog waste pickup a little easier. Well, there you go, a Ranger Rob poopy bags. Yes, that's something we actually designed, custom designed and made and sent out overseas to be built. And because you guys always want things affordable and it was the only way we could do it. Anyway, so they're done or just about everything is in place. We now have the Ranger Robs in sheets. And a lot of people are saying, well, do you have them in rolls? Yes, we have them in rolls now. And we have a really cool fabric dispenser so check out on amazon just type in ranger rob poopy bags that's p-o-o-p-y and ranger rob is all one word and it is our trademark so anyway yeah go check them out ranger rob poopy bags we appreciate it it helps the channel and it helps all of our other projects not just this and no you're not paying for my traveling you're just uh helping our channels and all of our other projects radio stations all that stuff uh, it's and 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 our retirement eventually. <laughs> it's a business that we are building up. So by the time we are eligible for Social Security and all that stuff, we have a supplemental income to go with it, which would be Ranger Rob poopy bags. So yeah, there you go. Yeah, one of the other things I wanted to bring up that I noticed that we couldn't do when we were RVing full time is the food situation. Um, I hate being limited to what I could buy. Uh, one of the things I had to give up was going to Costco. Uh, it was just too much for our RV to handle for storage. And I certainly couldn't, you know, ever gone to Costco and say like, wow, that's a great deal on meat. And you know, it's a quantity. And it's like when you get home, normally you would have to break it up and freeze it separately so you can have it for other meals, which was really hard to do in an RV. And then, so I found ourselves going to the grocery store more often and being and then there was a lot of kind of things that we didn't do cooking wise um, because we couldn't have that equipment in the RV along with all the other junk we had um, that we put in storage and it was really neat when we bought our house and when we pulled everything out of storage all these really cool things we had for cooking that we couldn't have in the RV. We have like a really nice KitchenAid mixer. No way could we fit that in the RV. We have a beautiful, really cool little bread maker. Couldn't you do that? We had a bunch of other pieces of equipment and a lot of cooking things. Um, larger quantity uh, casserole roll, um, dishes and stuff like that. We just couldn't take in the RV. And it was so nice to get all that stuff back. And then now that Sherry's still working and I'm retired, kind of, sort of, maybe, I'm doing much more cooking. And uh, uh, gosh, you know, it's a lot of things we didn't have because we either sold or got rid of it, like deep fryers and certain kinds of pans and stuff like that. To this day, I'm still replacing old stuff that we uh, 
thought we'd never use again, and I was so glad that some of them we held on to, but others we let go, and I'm rebuying them again. And it's like, ugh, that wasn't too bright. So uh, your cooking habits, and of course, a lot of times in an RV, it's such a hassle, you find yourself eating out too much. And uh, that's the one thing Sherry and I are trying to do is to cook at home more and try to quit eating so much preservatives and uh, fast food. Just a little better quality food. Is it helping our weight? <laughs> no. Is it helping our health? Maybe. <laughs> but uh, uh, we're not getting sick as much and not feeling yucky and stuff. And nice to have, you know, really good, instead of, you know, beans out of a can, we actually cook the real beans and, uh, and we just fix a lot of things, make our own pizzas, make our own lasagnas, things that you couldn't do in an RV. Uh, you could a little bit here and there, but really hard when you're limited on space. And so you will be giving up your cooking habits uh, a smidgen. And if you, <laughs> I think the other thing I really got frustrated over is fighting over the dining room table in the RV. Because I had computers and I was trying to do podcasts at the same time. It's like, I really think it's important in that you eat at the dining room table. So it was like a square dance, man. I was just telling you constantly moving things off the dining room table so we could either use it to actually eat on or to do business on. Uh, and you get a couple laptops going and stuff. It gets pretty crowded and then of course you got all the cords and all the other mouses and all that stuff um you just you're just not gonna have a smooth time at it um you do your best and you get used to it and it's kind of a you get used to living that way and it's okay but boy when you don't have to do that anymore and you can leave your laptop in one location and your computer up in one location and uh it's readily available for you whenever you need it. That's kind of nice, I gotta tell you. Don't you worry, I didn't forget about my gossip in <laughs> section there. And uh, of course, I've got to mention the wonderful little bluebirds that are on the back of the RV at, uh, what is those people call it? RV Odd Couple, which are milking that to death. And we know why, because they're looking for, and just go a couple videos back, looking for connections and collaboration. And so they found it, and they were able to connect up with, I think, the RV Radio USA, uh, which is a great station. I love those guys. But they seem to be, by the way, that seemed a little concerning that they're so deadly set upon bringing down Camping World. Now, I don't know any RV dealership that I actually trust. Uh, they all have their issues, but uh, I think they just love this bandwagon thing they're doing with the RV camping world. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, they got some processes they probably need to uh, definitely improve on. I can tell you, though, that we bought our RV at Camping World and it actually had no issues at all. And uh, we actually even had some warranty work and stuff like that done with the extended warranty, which is now lapsed. So anyway, uh, yeah, I heard that too. Anyway, um, uh, they're great. They're wonderful. And they also helped me install my um, Wi-Fi Ranger in my solar panels and stuff like that. And they did a great job and they were affordable and did quality work. So uh, to each his own, but I think they're they're kind of like treating camping world like liberals treat right wingers <laughs> so i'll just leave it at that <laughs> anyway why can't we all just get along but yeah so let's see what else i saw um uh, of course uh nomadic fanatic was having some trouble with his slide it was the first time i actually saw him pay for some service <laughs> and he seemed pretty happy with it and I actually did a nice call out to the people that did the work for him. And uh, he was complaining about the weather in Washington. <laughs> Don't we all? <laughs> I'm from Washington. It was like 11, I think 11 days it's been raining in a row. Yeah, that's Washington. He knows that. Anyway, but yeah, it's kind of, 
I think I'd bellyache too if I was up there rain that much, even though I know Washington, that's what keeps it green. But yeah, um, so us here in Arizona, we're going into, it's June, we're going into the monsoon season. And with all the crazy weather that's going on all over the United States, I'm kind of like, I'm not sure if I want to <laughs> see monsoon season. Um, monsoons can be quite uh, entertaining, but if they're amped up a little bit, as opposed to the ones in the past, I'm not sure if I'm looking forward to monsoons. I usually, I like monsoons, and uh, but they can get kind of wild. So it'll be interesting this year. Uh, to see what the monsoon season is like in Arizona. I also noticed Dan and Jen decided to put a video uh, out to tell us all how to be good boondockers and RVer etiquette. And I, I appreciate that they wrote the book on that. And they're telling us how we are supposed to act. Um, and they brought up some good things. I, I <laughs> it, just, it just drives me crazy that people are out RVing so much that they think they can make the rules and tell how everybody else should RV. And, uh, yeah, it's good to kind of send them. And it's too bad that we have to make videos like that because people are not taking care of facilities and building fires when they shouldn't, throwing garbage around when they shouldn't. It's like you bring it in, you take it out. And try to leave something better um, than how you left it. And it's too bad, but th this generation, these people, um, it's sad. And yes, we're going to end up losing a lot more privileges where they're just going to start locking gates and saying, no more overnighters. We just can't afford to be picking up this garbage anymore. And it's, you know, it's just, and that's what I was saying. It was really scary about even let your dog out. Let's say you are out in the middle of the desert, let alone not worry about rattlesnakes and stuff with your pets and stuff. But at the same time, Lord knows what they've thrown in the gravel uh, or broken bottles and things like that. And I worry about my pet out there. Um, so it was nice to see people doing the RV etiquette. At the same time, they actually sometimes I was like, OK, uh, but why do you feel like you have to be the policeman? And uh, uh, it was one of the comments, well, if, I've, if there's places that are better for big rigs and you're driving a small rig and you park there, the etiquette should be you take the smaller spot and leave the bigger spots for the bigger rigs. Who gives a crap? <laughs> it's first come, first serve, shut up, <laughs> period. It's like, yeah, too bad, but the guy got there before you. It's his spot period. There's no etiquette. He doesn't have to, just because he's got a little rig and you're crazy enough to drive your big rig in there and there's no places for big rigs, then take your big rig out and go someplace else. That's just how it is. It's first come, first serve. I know you guys are all used to these reservation systems and all that stuff. Hey, yeah, then you can call the shots. Boondocking, it's First come, first serve. You have no right to tell that one guy that's filling a spot that would have been better for a bigger rig to tell them to move or be upset with them. They got there before you. That's it. <laughs> Just saying. And last but not least, that's on my RV gossip. Um, actually, it's good gossip. Is I watched uh, Love Your RV. And if he listens to this, I hope he does. He doesn't realize he did a video of Telegraph Cove up in um, Vancouver Island. In 1986 and 87, we actually, I lived in Washington at the time, we actually took the Coho Ferry with our boats up there and drove all the way up there and actually fished out of Telegraph Cove two years in a row. And it was, it looked totally different. So it was so cool that the video he took of Telegraph Cove in 1986 and 7, it looked totally different. It was a little fishing bay, very primitive. Uh, <laughs> it was run down, but well used fishing little area. Now it's definitely been developed. They got the boardwalks around there. It looked a lot different, but 
and there was no RV park there uh, that he was showing. It was really cool to see the video, and he did a great job of showing on the map where he was going, what he was visiting. And uh, for me and Sherry, since we've been there a couple of times, we loved the area. The only thing he didn't do, <laughs> by the way, and my father made us do this, is we need to go find a garbage dump. I was like, what? He goes, oh, yeah. So we drove some back roads and dirt roads to find garbage dumps. Why did we go to the garbage dumps up there? Not to get rid of garbage, to watch the bears. <laughs> yes. And my kids were little. And so it was really cool to see all the bears. Um, and, you know, it's not good for the bears. I'm just saying that's a place bears go. And, of course, we get there and there's a big mama bear and two cub bears roaming around up there. And, of course, we stayed in our cars and stuff and took videos and pictures. But what a what a cool place. It was so easy to see wildlife. And when we were up there, uh, uh, we got to see, uh, we had boats, so we got to go see. We saw lots of whales, did lots of fishing. I caught a 37-pound link cod up there. And uh, we, they had the spring Chinooks up there, and that was fun. Uh, it was just a really good time, really good memory. So him doing a video like he did of Telegraph Cove um, and the way he did the mapping, I got to give him kudos. That was a great video for me and Sherry to watch. And, of course, you know, we had to make our kids watch it, too, because, you know, the kids were little, and uh, they remember it as the old time, too. So they get, they really appreciated the the way he did his video the best he could. And it's kind of funny. He goes up there in a different kind of mindset than like we did when we were up there. It was all about fishing and taking our boats out and, and roughing it. And uh, anyway, him just going up there as a tourist, it was kind of interesting to see that. Um, so anyway, thank you very much. Can't remember his first name, uh, but he always does really good videos. And he's been around for a good t a long time. And very consistent with the quality. And uh, when he reviews products, he does a really good job, too. So thank you very much. Love your RV, I believe is what it's called. Anyway, guys, I'm running out of time. I can't believe how fast this goes. I want to thank everybody for your feedback. And if you have any comments, please be professional. And we'll try to address them at the next show. Uh, be safe out there. Grab yourself an RV. It won't be very long. And Sherry and I will have our RV back. And we'll have more RV stories for you. In the meantime, we'll just kind of gossip. <laughs> or talk about reminiscing on when we were full-timing before. And then there'll be another time we'll do it again. It'll be neat to have the comparisons. So there you go. Anyway, guys, be safe. We'll talk to you next time. Bye now. Thank you for watching our video. Please take the time to like, subscribe, and share our videos all over. Then go down to the description and think about becoming a member of our Patreon. This will allow you to get special content just for you and help us build future content. Thank you.